Hello, hello everybody, and welcome to the next installment of The Chaos Protocol on Transplanar RPG. We are an all-transgender, people-of-color-led, dark fantasy TTRPG channel telling stories set in an original, non-colonial, anti-orientalist multiverse. Which means, as always, we'd like to start off this stream by reminding everyone we stand against genocide and ethnic cleansing and support all oppressed peoples of the world struggling against injustice, imperialism, and colonization. Our voices are not just for fictive stories. Free DRC, free Sudan, and free Palestine. Now, let's get chaotic! We are co-streaming tonight on Twitch and YouTube at Transplaner RPG and right here on TikTok at by Connie Chung, B Y C O N N I U C H A N G. If you're watching this right now, you are seeing the live recording of Arc 2 episodes 17 and 18. We are officially over halfway through Arc 2 of the Chaos Protocol. Woo! Which is so, so exciting. And we have an extremely thrilling announcement about our special guest episode in two weeks on March 23rd, Saturday at 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. After we come back from break, fans of Dropout, Critical Role, and Worlds Beyond Number, you are in for a treat. So mark your calendars, stick around until the break tonight, and drop your theories about who that guest star could be in chat. And now, please allow me to introduce my fantabulous cast, starting with Valiant Dorian. Hello, everybody. My name is Valiant Lovewinds Dorian. I use he and his pronouns. You can find me all on the internet at Valiant Dorian or at Also Spirit Bear. Please enjoy that lovely treasure I just set you on. Tonight, I have the distinct pleasure of playing your favorite fiery little Meow Meow Sayer. Uses he, they pronouns. Now, pass it over to Kai. Aw, thanks, Val. Hi, everybody. I'm Kai. I use he, they, and she pronouns. And tonight, I am back as dad question mark mr zanin esh who uses he him pronouns uh, i'm gonna pass it on over to our chronologist hey what's going on everyone it's your chronologist uh hi i'm sam star i use she they and the occasional fey pronouns um I sound very congested in my head right now, so much apologies. Uh, but yeah, I play Lumira, who uses she, her pronouns, our chronologist, our bad bitch, our girl boss, our healer, our lord and savior, honestly. Yeah, yeah, I would worship boss? at the cult of Lumira. Uh, it's a me, the boss baby. <laughs> oh, excellent, good, because I need to belong somewhere. Uh, anyway, to start off our announcements, a massive thank you to our sponsors for ARC 2, Explain Trade, Chepeku, Hero Forge, and Nine Heavens Press. So Explain Trade is, of all things, a negotiation skills training consultancy that believes in the power of Transplaner RPG's potential to grow, tell great stories, and lift up our communities. Thank you so much for believing in us now and always. Dimitri opines on Twitter. Twitter. Che Peku creates unique, imaginative, and outlandish TTRPG maps you won't find anywhere else. They've got dozens of variations and effects, and you can also use VTT integrations to make your worlds come to life digitally and or in person. Check them out at chepeku.com today, and if you want to see it in action, check out our past VODs on YouTube to see the backgrounds of ARC 2 using Che Peku's scenes. Nine Heavens Press is the publisher behind Undying Corruption, a 400 plus page D&D 5e and Pathfinder 2e adventure book that takes place in the fantastical country of Tongbuk, based on Korean mythology and made by a team of primarily Korean and Asian diasporic creators. You can see some of their beautiful art in action tonight during this episode as the background of our Twitch and YouTube stream. Pre-order Undying Corruption today by visiting bit.ly slash undying corruption with the u and the c capitalized and finally if you're in the twitch chat use exclamation point sponsors to get a full list of supporters for this stream and make sure to stick around during break to check out their products if you're on tiktok go to the link in my bio or transplanerrpg.com to learn more about us and now passing it over to val Hello, everybody. We'd like to also take a moment to thank our Patreon precepts. These are folks pledged the highest tier on our Patreon. Thank you so much to Alex, Astrid, The Bow System, Charles, Cassidy, Cora Eckert, Derek Davidson, Jordan, Lyle and Peanut, Mark J, Phil, Rose, Spencer, and Taylor. 
for supporting the second arc of Chaos. Use exclamation point Patreon in chat to learn more about our rewards and get access to some truly devious behind the scenes content. If you're enjoying the Chaos Protocol, please consider donating, donating and leaving us a tip. All tips go towards us as performers as well as, and will also be used to support our incredible mod team. Every time you donate $15 or more, you'll be entered to, into a raffle with, to win a very special dice set from Dispel Dice. Does this set remind you of anyone? A uh, chosen someone, perhaps? Use exclamation point donate in chat and toss a coin to the Twilight Guard. Y'all know what time it is. Last time on the Chaos Protocol. Strike Team Nova returns to the City of Mist. Lumira spends some quality time with Jirling as Sayura awakens his crescent blades with Luha and Zainan gambles with Longhui. But the symbols can feel one of their own in peril, and everyone races to the Azure Complex where Xuanzang is turning into a monster. Nova and the symbols are able to help the head administrator, and the Emperor appears as the battle closes. And that's what you missed last time. Use exclamation point recap in the Twitch chat to reach, read our full written recap document. Thank you for that, Sam. And now moving into the session itself. The Chaos Protocol is a dark fantasy series that may contain content that is triggering for some viewers. So content warnings for this session may include fantasy violence, grief, trauma, depictions of heights, visions, romance, references to sex, monsters and monstrosity, ghosts, and mentions of cannibalism, alcohol, and death of loved ones and family. If you're on the Twitch chat, use exclamation point CW to get a look at our content warnings at any time. Otherwise, go to transplanerrpg.com to learn more about our show and the topics that it handles. The title of tonight's episode is Gods Succumb and Demons Howl. From Carved Inside an Empty Urn by Connie Chung. Totally not ominous. Uh, and with that out of the way, let's begin. I need to do like a TikTok comp compilation of all the times I say the title and I go, totally not ominous, and all of you look horrified. Anyway, let's get started. Ten thousand years ago. The devouring ignited like a prayer sheet caught in a wildfire. Gods turned against gods, siblings against siblings, lovers against lovers. Divine desperation spilled across Yaolan in sanguine ebullitions, staining the cradle with violence, hunger, death. Amidst this chaos, the Azure Serpent sprang into being. They were a god of intellect and order, structure and numeration, tallies and tithes. They had scales like a spring flood, eyes of burning, piercing blue, and a small, scared, serpentine form that coiled across the battlefield, counting every fallen body, every brutal ascension, every lee of territory gained and lost, every knife in every back. The counting was a small, vulnerable light in the pitch black wood of their consciousness. The counting grounded them, the counting distracted them, but most of all, the counting protected them. The numbers told a story, provided crucial details. Using those details, the Azure Serpent survived. They hid under corpses, in the woods, between shadows, within the bloody fumes of the river itself. When the God Killer ascended, and began her campaign, that beacon of hope, that chosen one. The Azure Serpent watched from the comfort and the safety and the distractions of their numbers. 
They witnessed the death throes of the devouring from a bookkeeper's perspective, never participating in the gambits, never indulging in the wine of violence, but always keeping score. When the devouring finally came to an end, the Azure Serpent did what all the gods who chose to join the newly minted City of Heaven did. They shed their skin. The Azure Serpent left their old form behind and stepped into a new shape, a new name, a new life. Mu Chunzing slumps into the Emperor's arms. Their azure eyes are unfocused, their skin flushed, their chest heaving. Longdu holds them gently and steadily, looking with deep concern into the face of their head administrator, no, of their friend. The Emperor whispers something only Chunzing can hear, but it takes all the pain out of them. Their body stills, their heartbeat evens, the last of the scales flakes into mist. Twinzing's eyes flutter shut, and the eastern symbol finally, finally, finally rests. Holding Twinzing's slumbering form to their chest, Emperor Longdu looks up and addresses the gathered gods and cultivators in the Hall of Balance. The head administrator is the hardest worker the city of heaven has ever known. These recent calamities which have befallen our home have taken a strenuous toll on the most dutiful agent of heaven. The thickening of the mist, the disappearance of our colleagues, the monsters, all these disasters reminded Chunzing of the devouring of the last time we gods were in such desperate turmoil. And Chunzing's response to turmoil has always been to keep score, to count, to compute, to throw themselves into their work and never once rest. And at that, Longdu's eyes traveled to Lumira for a split second before settling on the symbol. Juling, Longhui, Luhua, please take care of Twinzing. They need to lie down and they need to be with friends. I know there is rivalry, I know there is friction, but for tonight, put those enmities aside and come together as you just did in this hall to watch over them. Can I trust you? Drooling lowers her head instantly. Lu Hua clasps their hand over their chest, and Lang Hui at the very back of the hall gives a slow but reliable nod. Good. Then take them back to their chambers and look over them and each other. Drooling strides forward. She takes Twinzing from Longdu's arms and holds them as though they weigh less than a feather. And for a moment, it looks as though the gentlewoman scholar wants to say something to the emperor, but at the last second, she bites it back. She steps back, joining the other symbols in the middle of the hall, and the emperor turns to face the three of you. As for you, cultivators, a private word. Step forward. Zynan mm -hmm. steps forward quickly. Yeah. He puts his bow away, lowers his head, and holds his hat against his chest. And his hand behind his back after he puts his bow against his quiver. Anyone behind him can see his fingers tighten in anxiety. Lumiere does what is the equivalent of a bow and a curtsy kind of combined. Her right leg sweeps behind her left and gracefully, almost like a swan, does she 
bow and show her respect before standing up in her nature and follows. Thea is always clumsy in situations like this. He is not built for this. (laughs) But in the moment of peak adrenaline, of surviving yet another destructive moment, he snaps his neck towards Wong Du, notices his strike team's movements, and follows quietly behind them, placing a fist against his chest and lowering his head, almost mimicking the same posture that Zainan has right next to him. As soon as each of you steps forward, you enter a different space, as though crossing the threshold into a secret chain. From the perspective of the symbols in the hall, it looks like Strike Team Nova has simply folded out of existence. You find yourselves in a vast, dimly lit room with handsome wooden walls, multiple floors branching upward toward a domed ceiling. Magical artifacts fill every crenellation of this space, hanging from walls, levitating above plinths, crowding the shelves. You see weapons of all shapes and sizes, enough to rival the innermost workshop of the White Forge. You see books bound in silk and leather, ancient tomes that would be right at home in the Vermilion Library. You see scrying bowls, incense burners, lavish tea sets that would be the envy of the most debaucherous den of the Black River. This chamber smells like smoke and tea, blade polish and cinders, mystery and might. The Emperor is here too. A shaft of muted moonlight pours through a window, casting a pale spotlight on her. Ta is positioned exactly as Ta was in the Hall of Balance, kneeling in front of a low table. Except this time, it's not an administrative desk. It's a tea table, complete with a teapot made of pure purple clay. Four cups are arranged on this ornate table with three cushions for each of you to kneel on. As your party folds into existence in this chamber, the Emperor addresses you. This is my private artifact room. The most powerful, magical, and dangerous objects in the Sister Realms can be found here within its walls. No one will disturb us here. Please, have a seat. Zainan steps forward quickly. He's letting his feet remember how to be an agent more than his mind will let him as he approaches the table and very purposely takes the center seat, places his hat on the floor behind him, and rests his hands in his lap. It's an honor. Hmm. Namira will follow... Zidon in line. Take a step to his left and kneel in the seat next to him. We are most gracious for your hospitality, Emperor. Of course. There, throughout uh, the Emperor's explanation, uh, was panning violently around to observe the new surroundings he found himself in the bangles on his tail jingle loudly clanging against each other on his tail as he swishes attempting to take in the entirety of his environment but eyes land right down towards the emperor he's focused now this hunger no longer a distraction he bites the corner of his lip it's the hunger sharpens into a blade and he steps forward towards Zainan's right, kneels on the cushion and faces the emperor. And there's a moment where he sees a queen in the place of the emperor sat surrounded by thick roots and just nods. Highness? I believe we can help each other. I have information that is uniquely suited to your party. 
and I believe you know more about what's happening here than the other gods in the city. But before I tell you what I know, I have a question. What one artifact is missing from my collection? How are we supposed to know what is missing from a collection? You're cultivators, yes? Equipped yes. with keen skills of observation and deduction? Correct. Put those skills to use, then. What's missing? Fair enough. And Lumira, her voice drops in that octave of fine, bet on. And she starts, she stands up from where she's sitting at and starts to make a slow trek walk around the room clockwise. And right as she gets to six o'clock, she will stop and walk right back around counterclockwise. Looking I think as at, Lumira mm -hmm. starts to go clockwise, Zainan stands up and seeing her go, starts to go the opposite direction and just scans the wall, but definitely walks further towards the center of the room, letting Lumira get the closer vantage. And he's mm. looking more up and around at the broader space because Zamira's the details person. Zainan's a spotter. Mm. And Sayer? And Sayer is a hunter. He looks at the person who asks the question. He looks at all of these artifacts. He notices if anyone's going to find an object out of place, it is the mirror. If there's someone who's going to find a shadow in unseen places, it is Sinan. If someone's looking for a trick of the light, then it's Sayer's job to do. And Sayer looks over at Longdu and is specifically judging the Emperor's demeanor as they're asking us this question. There's an instinct that bubbles within Sayer that this is a question beyond the surface, that there's something else that the Emperor is trying to get at here. Mm. Okay, I think what this means is, Lumira, I'd love for you to investigate a new location with a default plus two. One from Zainan and one from Seir as they help you. Would you like to invoke any other power tags? Can I still give her a help on top of that? Uh, yes. This is me basically not shortchanging, speeding up the process of using the help action, sure. essentially. So Great. Yeah. the most you would get yeah. from, like, the highest boon you could get from help a crewmate is a plus one. So I'm giving you the default best, mm. best outcome. Well, I also have a help point. That's what I was trying to offer. Oh, you got to spend that to make the help action. So That's right. I'm, I'm uh, you're right. letting you keep the help point and giving gotcha. you the best possible outcome. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Connie. Oh, you're great, very benevolent welcome, because I love it's the kind flavor. Of, you're so benevolent. <laughs> oh, you're, you're very being so kind. I can take that away, though, if you want me to. I no, 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 Biscuit butter really sent me. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm going to use... Uh, I'm going to use diagnoses, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, also, I'm going to use... Creating liminals. I think it's it's very it's very interesting because i imagine that lumira knows where she's at and what she's up against so there's things that are that are available to the naked eye and then there's things that are available beyond that if you just have the ability to look a little bit deeper mm. and i think by slowing that like 
putting herself kind of in its own in her own little liminal for a spec while she's walking around looking at this she's giving herself more time to find those trace those hidden end traces of what's being left behind if there's anything deceiving like are there yes. any evidence left behind of magic any trails left of something that could sure. be hidden from what i'm seeing any after images, any traces yeah. of mm -hmm. magic that was once here. Excellent. So that's a plus four to your roll. Go for it. Thirteen. That's excellent. Okay. On a ten plus, the GM will describe an additional crucial detail that even a skilled sleuth might miss. In addition to describing the area's general ambiance and any prominent features that your trained senses notice. Yes, I think this means you figure out what the missing artifact is. So Lumira, as you do a roundabout of the artifact room, clockwise, counterclockwise, Zainin and Seir in their positions, feeding you auxiliary information. Zainin looking for the things unseen, the shadows, the darkness. Seir focusing on the countenance of the person who asked this question in the first place, Lumira, your eyes are drawn to where Seir is looking, which is straight ahead at the Emperor. And something clicks into place like an unseen puzzle piece sliding in for that final clue. The Emperor had folded the three of you into existence in this artifact room with intentional positioning so that you would be looking directly at the thing that's most obvious, the thing that's hidden in plain sight. Behind the Emperor, carved into an elevated nook, is an empty pedestal. It's not very large. It is certainly not big enough to hold a sword or a glaive or anything like that. But it's also not extremely small. It's definitely bigger than, say, a teacup or a hairpin. The size of the pedestal is somewhere in the middle of these two ranges, roughly the scope of a teapot or a large book. There's no plinth to speak of, no written evidence of what was once there, no neat label for you to just say what the object was. But it does occupy a seat of honor directly behind the emperor, carved into the very center of this room. So whatever is missing is also what's most important. And it's gone. An additional detail I'll give you, as your liminal senses flare for just a second, you see ghostly after images of the people that used to be in this space. And there's just one. It's just the Emperor. You see her moving around you as though a form cut out of mist, stopping in front of various artifacts and then pausing in front of this empty plinth, cocking their head to the side and then whoosh, the mist washes away past your eyes. And you realize what that means. That object, as long as you've been in here, the City of Mist, has always been missing. One of the first things the Emperor did when the Mist took everyone to the city was come to this artifact room, that's what that silhouette was, and go right toward that pedestal in search of whatever was there and found it gone. So the only reasonable explanation is that perhaps it was taken when everyone else was taken, but in reverse, there's some fuckery afoot here. I like to think that at some point, Lumira, Zainan, and Sayir all going their each different ways converge at a certain point on that clock at the same time. And it's like a, so, did you see that spot behind him? Uh, they are mm -hmm. looking, they put us in a spot where we would not look anywhere else except but at them, but Ta is standing right in front of a blank spot. Best hiding spot. Plain sight. Exactly. So they exchanges a look with, with uh, exchanges a look between Zainan and Lumira, 
and I, for the both of you, he's basically communicating from all the time we've worked together. There's fuckery afoot, and the Emperor is probably going to know that we've caught on to that. Right on cue, the Emperor says, So, I see your gazes have fallen upon the empty plinth behind me. Very well done. Any guesses as to what that artifact is, or rather, was? Given the location of it and your history, perhaps something to do with what put you in this elevated position in the first place. Perhaps. Perhaps not. What about what the object takes the shape of? It's not too large, not too small. Could fit in your hand with some maneuvering. Is there... Is there any... Anything significant on Ta? Like, it is, are they wearing a type of... of like, are they wearing a, a symbol or, or a crest? Are they wearing any type of significant, like, insignia or or even just clothing, anything like that, that I would recognize that could kind of point to something that I would associate different objects of that type of, of, of someone who would wear that, that outfit with, if, if that makes any sense. Yes, the emperor is in flowing, deep, rich purple robes, and there's a motif of dragons kind of carved with a silvery embroidery all along the robes, bathed in clouds of rolling mist. It's a beautiful set of robes, deeply rich, very royal. Your eyes are also drawn to a rich, brightly silver sash around their waist. Yes, that's just a regular part of many gods, Hanfu here, many gods' robes and outfit is the sash. Xiao Cheng had a sash as well. And Sayer looks back at the spot behind the Emperor and looks around where I assume there's probably porcelain vases around mm -hmm. and turns to look at the Emperor again. His eyes, blue, sharp, piercing blue eyes narrowed to the fine point of an arrow, a vase or a jug. Very close. A gourd. The Zynan gourd cannot keep the like reaction off of his face. I think Lumira's he's... eyes bug too, just a just a little bit. It is known as the river gourd. It is the oldest and rarest object in my collection. No in the entirety of the Sister Realms. Not many gods know this, in fact, very few. The River Gourd is the very source of the mist itself. And now it is gone. Huh. Uh, well... I've seen it. Explaining where it is is a lot more complicated. The Emperor's eyebrows rise, almost imperceptibly at that, but they do rise. Where? There and are Zynan two cities of heaven. Sayer mutters, there are two cities of heaven. One where you and the other gods exist. One where, well, I can't say the others, but one other exists, and sometimes we arrive there too. <laughs> yes. The three of you travelers between realms. Lumira looks between both Zainan and Sayir and are like <sighs> It, it just 
flows out of them just information and I'm like I think Lumira is a bit more trying to hold more cards to the chest just a bit um trying to to probe for a bit more information so the fact that they're throwing information out so willingly unprovoked she's like oh. or there's also that hmm <laughs> It's with someone that you trust, that trusts you, which is why, and Zidane looks to Lumira, I think it's best that we are all on the same team. Her eyebrow quirks, like, challenging me, but also a level of respect in there, like, well played. Let me guess. The person it's in the possession of is my courtier. Correct. Exactly that. Have you seen them since this? And she swishes her hand around to what's happening in relation to around them in the mist. Have you seen them since this has all happened? Longdu, as soon as the three of you confirm that the river gourd is with Xiao Cheng, they let out a deep sigh of relief. They close their eyes for a moment, and when they open them, they address you, Lumira. No, I have not. Not since the mist took everyone else to this other city. The head administrator had declared your group taken by the mist and the chaotic aftermath of the Hall of Peerless Destiny. And yet, here the three of you kneel, not as monsters, but as yourselves, having returned to the City of Heaven no worse for wear. Let's not beat around the bushes any further. You all went to a different city. A city where Xiao Cheng exists, yes? Yes, and not as a monster. Correct. And at that, I want to know, do you tell the Emperor about your time in the Empty City? Lumira taking a... She will look towards both Zainan and Sayir for last-minute confirmation before... And she gets the okay from the both of them. Uh... She will lean forward just a tad. Permission to speak freely, Emperor. Please do. Yes. I'm still not 100% sure how and why, but wherever we go, when we are not here, we are with Xiao Chang, and they are safe, lonely, but safe, wondering just like we are. Are there any other gods in this other city? None that we are aware of. Mm -mm. Xiao Chang they have told us they've looked and couldn't find anyone else. There is a goose. Also goose. Goose. Brother goose. Yes. Mm. Brother goose. They're I am assuming. I'm assuming Nasty. you're not familiar. Huin Xiaocheng does not have an animal companion and certainly no brother goose. Well, they do in this other city of heaven. That's interesting are they a magical goose a divine goose are they a two-headed goose they're a they're white just goose, goose. Hmm. that's just the one head from what i remember fascinating well thank you for sharing this information i have some information to share with you in turn but first another reflection of gratitude for aiding my symbols in the protection of the city of heaven I acknowledge that I have been absent during these encounters. The reason is I have been preoccupied with venturing into the mist. 
I have used every magic at my disposal as the Emperor Immortal to dispel it, traverse it, plumb its secrets, but the deeper I go, the thicker the fog becomes. There is no end to it here. It is limitless, infinite. Even gods eventually must answer salvation's call, but there is no call here. There are no boundaries, no destination. It just keeps going. Hmm. Before I tell you what I believe is happening, I would like you to offer your theories. All of the clues are on the table. The two cities, the strange behavior of the mist, its impossible persistence despite the concerning absence of the river gourd, its unending nature, the perpetual eventide we find ourselves in in this city, and the fact, it seems, that you've been taken every dusk and returned every dawn. What do you think is happening? With all due respect, Emperor, I am more intrigued with what your idea of this is. You are the one who is experiencing it firsthand. We are just after effects. Hmm. If I can understand what happens to the gods, Maybe I can get a better understanding of what happens to the cultivators. I would not refer to you or your party as mere after effects. You play a more crucial role than you can imagine here. I can tell you my theory more than a theory. What I know is true, but I would like to know what you think is happening as well before I divulge this. A question for you then. If Please. you'll indulge me. How do you know that heaven is still in heaven? There You've are... given me all the keys to my answer. Mm. I think Xiao Cheng is in heaven. And we are not. Where do you think we are? Given that we have some assurance that Yaolan is still there, the only thing we haven't explored is the underworld. <laughs> Process of elimination. If we truly have been transported to the underworld, I promise you the demons would be having a field day. Which then what's is in the mist? Exactly why I feel just the opposite, Sinan. I think you're on the right track. Not to disrespect your theory, but I think too far left. I think we are in between, like limbo Cotton or purgatory. purgatory. Yes. yes, Lumira, you are very, very close. Seir, you have been quiet. What troubles your mind? Seir keeps thinking about the monsters, the monstrification, the, the will of the mist itself. Being put into a separate plane is one thing, but what about the movements of, of this? And of course, there's the whole question of why Xiao Cheng is the only one spared. And Thayer kind of looks up towards the Emperor. It explains everything but the thing that everyone fears, the devouring being placed into a separate bubble, dimension, limbo in between. But what about the miss? What about the... And he hesitates. What about the devouring? The monsterification that even leaves the four symbols vulnerable to its call? Hmm. Good questions all. Good theories all. Good considerations, all. Here is what I think. I believe that we are in a dream. Excuse me. That the two cities of heaven are the waking one and the slumbering one. 
The empty city you speak of is the real city. This one is but a nightmare. A nightmare Full. realized in such painfully acute detail because it draws upon the collective consciousness of all the dreaming gods of the city of heaven. As for where our slumbering bodies in the waking world are, I believe they are trapped in the gore. It would make some things I've seen make sense. So, you believe within the gourd that we have now established is in the possession of Sao Chung is holding the souls or entities of bodies minds and souls yes gourd is a powerful magical artifact no doubt it could hold all of the gods of the city of heaven and yes given our combined information the most likely cause of this dreaming mist is my courtier of four symbols i do not know why and i do not know how but Hun xiao cheng must have opened the river gourd on the night of my proclamation. I do not believe them to be malicious, only misguided. They must have had their reasons, and I doubt they knew that all of this would happen as a result of the gourd's opening. Perhaps they were seeking a different outcome. But what that outcome might be, and why they felt motivated to go to such drastic lengths, I am unsure. But above all, I trust <coughs> Xiao Chen. Heavenly Emperor. Yes. What is the gourd? You call it a powerful artifact. But you haven't told us what it does. What it could do. The river gourd is the font of the mist. It is the font of all magic in the sister realms. Whether the gourd produces the mist by itself or is simply a portal into a greater realm remains a mystery even to me. I came into possession of the River Gourd during my campaign to end the Devouring. I learned of its existence and its abilities from a great sage who lived at the very peak of heaven. Back then, heaven was not yet a city. It was a blood-soaked battlefield. I built this place into the home that it is now. The mist from the Devouring. It was described as being hungry this one is different yes it is different but i do not know why it's a lingering mystery the answer eludes even me i know not why the fog has shifted to behave the way that it does but there is something wrong with it here that much we do know it is a haze of deceit. It is a force of monstrous transformation. It brings out not the best in us, but the worst in all of us. This is not how the mist should be. This is not how the mist wants to be. Something is warping it, hurting it. I suspect that the source of that hurt is here, in the city of dreams. Not? Xiao Cheng, who holds the gourd? It is not possible for Xiao Cheng to be the agent of the mist's corruption. Only those within the mist are capable of influencing it, of changing it. Hmm. This blanket of denial is hiding something else, perhaps someone else's true motives. Another force I cannot quite ascertain, at least not yet. Someone close hmm. enough to want some very key figures out of the way. That's my number one question. Have you noticed them at all being more eccentric or doing things out of the ordinary, even for them as of recent, speaking to anyone, doing... I'm, I'm trying to piece together the pieces of who could be influencing them 
to do something like this and then at the same time also have the power to affect something as innately divinely powerful as this place it it goes beyond anything i can wrap my brain around right now yes the person influencing this mist must have a deep buried hidden secret corrupt desire it must be so deep and so powerful that even I can't sense it, that even the mist is bending to their will, such as the force of their emotion. So you do not believe that this warping is intentional, or do you believe that it is so? That I am not sure. The mist does draw upon our subconscious and conscious desires, but for it to transform like this, to take the gods, of the city of dreams and turn them into monsters to bring out the worst in all of us. I feel it must be conscious at this point. Perhaps not when we were first taken, but now? It is mm. the next highest priority for me to investigate while I am here inside the gourd. Which brings me to the three of you. You three are clearly not simply cultivators from Gaolan. This, I can tell at a glance. You are walkers between realms. Agents of a higher will. This is why the magic of the mist does not affect you like it does the other gods of the city of heaven. This is why you can return to the empty city while the rest of us remain trapped here inside the gourd. Use this power to your advantage. I believe the fate of both cities rests upon your shoulders. At the word fate, Zynan's eyes lock. First on Lumira, and then slide across to Seir. And then he bows respectfully. We will do this. Lumira's never been able to really hide from y'all. So her eyes have been dinner plates pretty much this entire time. And she much less gracefully than before kind of bows in it. It, you can tell something's a tad off. Thayer's eyes linger on Lumira for a moment. How could he not recognize those eyes, the emotions they communicate? And protectiveness flares and he leans forward, hoping to sink the entire gaze of the Heavenly Emperor. Yes, Heavenly Emperor, I, um, and as soon as Seir realizes that he's been speaking to the Emperor like his old self, he finds it hard to bring that mask back up, and he just clumsily puts it on before half measures put in place. It's, it seems that we need to speak to your court here. When you found it missing and the timing when it was taken. That's what we need to investigate next. Right? Right. <laughs> yes. We'll do this. I ask that you please work with Xiao Chong, not against them. Together we can find a way to right this wrong, of that I am certain. No, they're it's it's clear they're they're not the ones the one behind this. It's Exactly. No, there's someone scene. here. I shall investigate in the City of Dreams while you carry out your tasks in the City of Heaven. I do request that you are careful with whom you share this information. As for the gods of the City of Heaven, I ask that you be discreet. The more people who know that this is a dream, 
the more that the dream will unravel, and the more volatile the mist will get. Have you ever noticed in your own slumbering hours, realizing that everything is but a dream, things begin to warp toward nightmare? Things will only worsen. More people like Chunzing will be claimed. If we keep the truth contained, we can unravel the mystery before even more people get hurt. Then you should caution specifically Luhua. Keep them closer from the mist. Hmm. <laughs> yes. I will make sure to pass that on to the apprentice, and if it falls upon unlistening ears, then to their reticent forge master. I have another request of the three of you to not just speak to Xiao Cheng, but to help them break us all out of the gourd. Now that we know we are trapped inside the river gourd, the way to return the gods to the city of heaven is to simply uncork it. But this task is actually not so straightforward. As the font of all mystery, the gourd refuses to be fully, truly known. But it will, on occasion, allow you to peer inside. The only person I am aware of who knows how to coax it open is the great sage who told me of its existence in the first place. They reside on the tallest peak of the city of heaven, and they are not here, in the city of dreams. I tried seeking their audience and found nothing but mist, so they must somehow be out there, in the empty city. Similar to Xiao Cheng, another god who has eluded the mist's grasp. When you return to the real city of heaven, take the gourd to the great sage and seek their help. We will do this. Hopefully they're alright. Xiao Cheng's gonna be very excited that there's anyone else at all <laughs> if i know my courtier as well as i think and hope i do i imagine they are in a state of great distress and anxiety right thank you Very well. heavenly emperor you are most welcome our fates are entwined cultivators. These cities are entwined. The wellness of one impacts the wellness of the other. If I may. Please. We're, we will keep your secrets. Will you keep ours? This is only just and fair. You have my word. It's an honor. Thank you. Wildly enough, Lumira has to bite her tongue because the second the Emperor starts to mention that our fates are entwined, it's almost like breathing Lumira's natural callback in her will we trust. Mm. And she starts before she stops herself, mid-sentence, remembering where she is. It's low, en it's low enough for her team members to hear, but not out loud. It's... She just bows again and looks to her teammates if the emperor heard what you whispered under your breath ta certainly doesn't show it they begin to rise with a respectful quarter bow toward the three of you i appreciate your assistance and i appreciate your help but soft the dawn is coming i can sense it even through this shroud of secrets. Quick, when you wake, 
tell Xiao Cheng that I know they must be scared, I know they must be anxious and desperate, but not all is lost. Together, we can and we will bring the gods back. Travel to the tallest peak, meet the great sage, open the gourd. And then you blink, and the emperor is gone. The tea table is gone, the artifacts are gone, and the hazy shaft of moonlight is gone. You find yourselves standing once again in the hall of peerless destiny, the bright light of morning filtering through tall windows. Strike Team Nova, you are back in the empty city, and you are awake. And you are alone. And we're going to cut to break there. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in so far. What a twist. The classic, it was all a dream. Uh, we'll be back in 10 minutes. Enjoy the fan art reel and the sponsor shout outs in the meantime. And stick around for the second half because we're going to announce who our incredible guest NBC is going to be. I wonder who could they could be portraying. Hmm, I wonder what character they might be portraying the special guest NBC. So if you're a fan of Critical Role, Worlds Beyond Number and Dropout, please stay tuned for after the break. We love you. See you in 10 minutes. Be show, be show. Transplainers, are you looking for high quality fantasy maps for your next tabletop campaign? Chepeku has you covered. Get your hands on more than 4,000 hand-drawn fantasy maps and battle maps that will take your campaign sessions to the next level. Che and Peku are a couple who love maps. That's their passion and they're so good at it. They create unique and original worlds with outlandish themes and ideas you won't find anywhere else. Che Peku maps have the imagination to match yours. Chepeku's archive has more than 4,000 original hand-drawn maps, with map packs added every week that include variations for seasons, weather effects, and even time of day. 
So if your players spend the entire session in a tavern role-playing with NPCs, you can seamlessly switch to nighttime. Chepeku even offers fully mapped multi-level dungeons, animated maps with cool terrain effects, and seamless integration with the most popular virtual tabletops out there, including Alchemy RPG, Roll20, Foundry VTT, Encounter Plus, Fantasy Grounds, and more. Their maps even come with wall and lighting effects for Foundry VTT, letting you plug and play as quickly as possible. If this sounds appealing to you, because I know it sounds appealing to me, head over to Chepeku's Patreon today and get access to their full archive of over 4,000 maps for as little as $5 a week. Use exclamation point Chepeku in chat to get a link to their Patreon and tell them Transplaner sent you.
Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome back to the back half of the Chaos Protocol at this very special ARC 2 stream. Before we hop right back into the session, a uh, couple of sponsor shout outs. So, Chepeku is one of our incredible sponsors. They create unique, imaginative, and outlandish TTRPG maps you won't find anywhere else. It's honestly, genuinely, even if they didn't sponsor us, I would shout them out because their art is really awesome and they are just a great couple of creators who love to bring uh, really imaginative outlandish maps and scenes to life. So go to chepeku.com to learn more about them. Supporting our sponsors helps support us. Uh, the other sponsor shout out we have for today is Nine Heavens Press. They are the publisher behind Undying Corruption, which is a huge chunker of a D&D 5e and Pathfinder 2b adventure book over 400 pages taking place in the fantastical country of Tonguk, based on Korean mythology and made by a team of primarily Korean and Asian diasporic creators. I love that shit. I, again, just like with Che Baku, I would support this stuff even if they didn't sponsor us. So you can see some of that beautiful art as part of their uh, source book in action during this episode. You've seen it already in the backgrounds of our YouTube and Twitch streams. So pre-order Undying Corruption today by visiting bit.ly slash Undying Corruption with the U and the C capitalized. And even if you don't have the funds right now, just using that link, clicking on that link helps us because it helps us track how many people click uh, and go there because of our stream. So, <laughs> Let's talk about the announcement, the big one, the one that you've all been waiting for. I know that you've all had your theories about who our guest star is gonna be. So as promised the revelation, fans of Dropout, Critical Role, and Worlds Beyond Number rejoice for in two weeks on March 23rd, five days before my birthday, the very special one and only Erica Ishii will be joining us as an incredible NPC guest star. It's going to be a very special charity stream on top of that for the Palestine Children's Relief Fund. So mark your calendars for Saturday, March 23rd. Tell your friends about this amazing appearance by Erica and drop your theories about who they might be playing in the chat. Hmm, I wonder who Erica might be playing for our stream. Yay! I'm so fucking and now, feral about this. I know, I'm literally I'm shooting my pants about it. Don't worry about it. So uh, <laughs> Don't do that on stream. <laughs> Mm, you'll be able to tell. Anyway, uh, let's get right back into the session with content warnings. So the Chaos Protocol is a dark fantasy series that may contain content that is triggering for some viewers. So please take care of yourselves. Content warnings for this session may include fantasy violence, grief, trauma, descriptions of heights, visions, it's not me banging my mic, visions, romance, references to sex, monsters and monstrosity, ghosts, and mentions of cannibalism, alcohol, and death of loved ones and family. So use exclamation point CW in chat if you're in the Twitch chat to get a look at our content warnings at any time. And if you're on TikTok or YouTube, go to transplanerrpg.com, aka the link in my bio on TikTok to learn more about our show and what our content is all about. With that out of the way, let's get started. Strike Team Nova. Deja vu settles over your party as you stand in the empty, the real hall of peerless destiny. The last time you were here, you'd been shaking off the nightmares of mist made beasts, with Xiao Cheng at the foot of that throne of red sandalwood. But this time, the three of you are alone. Xiao Cheng is nowhere to be seen. Neither is the artifact room, though it must be close by. Upon waking, the mist must have deposited you to the closest public location adjacent to that room, which is here. The Hall of Peerless Destiny. It's odd being back here, knowing that the city of mist is but a dream. But now that you're consciously aware of it, this version of the city does indeed feel more real. The ground beneath your feet is solid and cold. A breeze tickles your skin. Your eyes feel unclouded. Or perhaps it's less that this city is more real and more that the shroud from the dreaming city has been lifted from your consciousness. You realize 
that the befuddling haze that whelms you every time you step from night to day is, in fact, the haze of dreams. No wonder you forget who you are during that transitional period. No wonder the troubles of the City of Mist are literal nightmares. In retrospect, all of this makes sense. You simply had to lift the curtain of mystery to perceive it. Strike Team Nova. As you gather your bearings in this empty, real hall of peerless destiny, what is the first course of action that you take? Eurydice Protocol. Eurydice Protocol. Activate. Do you say that in character? I say your No! <laughs> Eurydice Protocol. Activate! Activate! Activate. Uh, <laughs> You know what? I think it's kind of uh, funny for Sayer to be the one to call the Oracle, because uh, he hasn't actually done that. So as soon as we land, Sayer um, like pulls his arm up and just says, Eurydice Protocol activate, and just calls the Oracle. The Oracle appears in a swirl of orange light and a puff of a light, uh, refreshing citrusy scent. Oh, hello, Strike Team Nova. It's so good to see the three of you again. Shall I give you a play-by-play, beat-by-beat of my day so far? Later, Maybe later. sweetheart. Oh, We need oh, okay. Artemis at this point in time. I do apologize. All right, no problem. I'll give it to you later then. Uh, calling Artemis. <laughs> and Artemis appears. In that haze of blue static, all pixels and power and a wavering magical hum around their silhouette. Well, thank you, Connie. Artemis does look at you instantly. Unlike in your first call, the patron saint is already looking at all of you through that miasma of static when the connection is finally made. Her eyes check over each of you quickly, ensuring that you are safe, ensuring that you are well, ensuring that there are no holes in you, ensuring that you are alive. And when they find what they're looking for, they nod. Welcome back, Nova. Status update? Things have developed. We've gotten some troubling answers and shortly after this we have someone we have to go find but first I think we have quite a bit to catch you up on we met Emperor Longdu tell me everything and Lumira's eyebrow quirks and it just like play by play as if you were actually there down to where everyone was standing in the room, you get exactly what happened, all the information, what Lumira knows about this so far, and leaves the door open for Sayer and Zainan to add in what they feel is necessary or anything that I forgot or was not there for. There's a special kind of attention, I think, that comes when somebody is writing down your every word and you see it. You see Artemis's hand moving just off of frame, like noting everything that you say down, every single one of you. And when you finally come to the end of this update, Artemis nods thoughtfully. Zainan does add, new to both of you as well, that the Emperor and the uh, ruler of the Underworld have a striking resemblance. Mm -hmm. Does Sayer any add anything in particular? Sayer um, is... I think looks very different to Artemis, where before distraction was gnawing at the corners of his mind that's only focused when hunger is so devastating that it forces you to hunt to observe that's what's 
you see in Sayer, finally, the old Sayer is back. The hunter is back. And he doesn't... I think he chimes in every now and then for any observations that he makes of Emperor Long Du. And I think mm -hmm. the only thing he adds is, as everyone has said, I don't think it's Xiao Cheng. There's someone else that's either taken advantage of the situation or has carefully plotted for everything to come to a head as it has. The only one who has all those answers for us is the, the courtier. I see. Well done, the three of you. Those are the agents I know, the agents I trained. And again, that little flash of pride flicks in her eyes. You are very wise for having made contact with the Emperor herself. And at this point, it seems like your task is a straightforward one, if not easy. Do as she says, take the river gourd to the tallest peak and reunite the two cities of heaven. Then you can focus on who exactly is causing such a disturbance within the mist. Hmm. Wouldn't want it to happen again. Precisely. I have an update on my end as well, pertaining to your ask from last time, Agent Ash. It seems that you are right, twofold. There already is a strike team on Yaolan, attending to the disasters in the mortal realm. And that team is Strike Team Phoenix. Hand Lucy brought me their update from On Mission just a few hours ago. And? And you seem to have hit a bullseye. Well done. The report from Lucy suggests exactly what you stated in your last debrief, environmental and social collapse on a grand scale. Many mortals are suffering, and Phoenix believes that it is directly caused by the absence of the gods. There is nothing that they can do from their position, Sans helping who they can, wherever they are. Apparently, there are a great many of he Apparently, there are a great many heroes coming forth but there will be no salvation until the gods are restored to their proper realm. They seem to be the fabric of this world, the fabric of the journey of itself within this realm. Your mission to restore them back to the waking world is of the utmost importance. It is good to know that Phoenix gets to be there to guide the journey. Someone must. Thank you. Lumira goes so tense. Her eyes wide again. <clears throat> Hearing her old strike team is also here. Amaru is here. As is Kove. And almost reading your expression, reading your thoughts, reading your face, Artemis goes on to say, we are working on establishing a stable connection between you and Phoenix at this point. The threads of the journey are loose all over the sister realms, so it seems, so it may take some time. In the meanwhile, I'll focus on your mission. Is Han Lucy all right with this? It spills out of Lumera's mouth before she's even able to stop it I think it's her own it's her own lack of self-confidence in this moment Hand Lucy and I had a long discussion about it we believe that this is the best course of action given that both of our teams are enacting Eurydice protocols. And Agent Zaron and I have a good working relationship. Hmm. So I've heard. And Artemis almost like looks away and notes something like kind of, you see her hand like move down to like a margin somewhere and like make a note <laughs> of that. Zaynid like is full back. of crap. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, mm -hmm. it's like a tally gets placed somewhere, like if some kind of bet between her and Lucy going on in the background there. And they look over the three of you just once more. 
Sayer scoffs hearing about Strike Team Nova. It's hard now that the mask is be is peeling off against his will. More of his old self is coming back and he tries to shake it off of him. And then he catches on to something that that you said, Hand, and he looks up both enacting the Eurydice Protocol. Like I mentioned, the disasters on Yaolan are seeming to break apart the very fabric of the journey, depending on what region Strike Team Phoenix is traveling to. Things have been getting a little distant for the Syndicate. They're able to make contact in holy sites near Ascension Gates, though they are not able to travel. Huh. Understood. And you are sure Hand Lucy is all right with her team working somewhat in tandem with me? Yes. You are my strike team member, and I shall not put you in any danger just because of past circumstances. This is what the Prime Oracle has decreed. Strike Team Phoenix is on Yaolan, and you are in the City of Heaven. This is how it is. This is how it will be. Yes, sir. Lumira. And she looks up at you. And Sayer says nothing but looks into your eyes with his bright blue ones. And... There's a moment where the real Sayer wants to peek through, but instead a brightness shines through instead. It'll be okay. We'll just do what we have to, okay? It's very likely that you will not come into direct contact with Strike Team Phoenix, at least not until the realms are restored to one. You're close now, Nova. Keep going. Yes, sir. Heard. Very well. Trust in her will. Trust in her will. Trust, Trust in her will. And the static evaporates in a little puff of sparkling smoke. <laughs> The oracle squishes uh, back into existence now that the call dissipates in those sparkles and in that mist. Oh, uh, is the call we had Archimus done? I didn't want to interrupt with my play-by-play. -play. Uh, yes, um, we're, we're done with that. Before you regale us with your endeavor for the time that we were gone, Mm -hmm. Where is the courtier? Oh, that's at the very end of my play-by-play, -play, but if you would like to speed to Mira that- Mira drops three ball bearings <laughs> on the top <laughs> immediately, <laughs> like, please the things that are important right now. Oh, delicious. Okay, so as for the courtier's location, Xiao Chong is currently getting harassed by some demons at the Plum Leaf Ascension Gate, and I think they're in a lot of trouble. Oh, why did you that, lead with that? Yes. Not and only why did you lead around. with that, but why, why didn't you lead with that? But why was there not more alert in your voice behind that? Why did you oh, mention well, that like we were taking a stroll? Well, you said that I should wait until the end. Would we like to take some time here to unpack? Maybe why I didn't tell you that immediately? No, I, no, no, no darling. We have and to go. She drops another one in the oh. top. No. Mm -hmm. Okay, follow me. And all of you follow the Oracle, who levitates forward out of the Hall of Peerless Destiny like a, like a little orange that's just bobbing along a stream. <laughs> and they're out. Sighted aside, does actually say to Lumira, we need to get a tune-up scheduled. <laughs> Our next bit of downtown we have, I will take to the schematics and update it. You never remove my sparkling personality! I never want to. <laughs> you dim witted creation of faith, I swear! Ah, <laughs> oh, it takes one to know one! At least I was wanted! 
Uh, Oracle! <laughs> I can do it. Are you gonna follow me or what? Or are we just gonna keep shouting back and forth at each other? No more ball bearings. What? For the rest of the day. Uh, oh, Grounded. Oh, oh. Down. No, no. Well, That's not uh, nice. Apologize. The Oracle screeches to a halt in the middle of the ramp leading out of the Hall of Peerless Destiny and turns from one part of their faceless body to the other part of their faceless body to look at you. Well, if you want me grounded, I suppose you won't know how to get to the ascension gate now. Would All you? of you, that we are is in a hurry. The absolutely. journey is in is at stake here. Can we have this disagreement later? Lumira is stomping her foot. Like, uh -uh. <laughs> oh, I'm stomping my foot too. Just imagine it. Stomp, stomp. If you Oracle, have... Oracle, mm. please. Yes, Papa. Follow me. Fine, Agent Ash. Uh, <laughs> Sayer groans. <laughs> the oracle turns again, that twig spiraling and the leaf flowing in the wind, and it, faster than you can almost keep up with, they start zooming uh, down the ramp and leading you to the Plum Leaf Ascension Gate, which is located within the second courtyard of the Royal Palatial Complex, which is some 15 kilometers away from the Hall of Peerless Destiny. So you're booking it for a minute. The Oracle leads you through the dizzying sprawl of the Heavenly Palace. You breach the gates in reverse. So the fourth gate first, then the third. This fourth gate is as rich as smoke and light as tea. The courtyard surrounding it teeming with imperial buildings made of pure jade. Past the fourth gate, you find the third courtyard, rich with rolling hills, devoid of divine beasts, beasts who have been taken by the mist just like their tenders. Those, magnifi those magnificent creatures, too, are dreaming. You traverse rich woodland, emerald fields, sapphire rivers, silver footbridges, until you reach the third gate, an archway as red as blood and white as bone. As you step beneath this paifong, you find yourselves amidst blooming orchards filled with magical fruit trees, oranges of wisdom, lychees of joy, peaches of immortality. But even these divine fruits require careful tending. It's been over a week since the heavenly arborists have taken care of their orchards, so the ground is dense with thick golden pollen. Weeds poke through roots, overripe fruit hangs low on pained branches, the most rotten of them fallen and splattered all across the soil. The oracle pauses, momentarily distracted by an orange tree. Uh, and again, though they have no eyes or face, they seem to be staring at a perfectly spherical clementine, as though seeing something of themselves in its reflection, but then they shake themselves and continue levitating forward. Your strike team steps past a dense thicket of berry bushes and into a clearing. A courtyard, to be exact, framed by four buildings and populated by various divine trees. A sign above this archway reads, Plum Leaf Courtyard. And in the center of this sizable plaza, you see an elevated dais carved with the same runic calligraphy as the portal your party zapped in on, except the runes are glowing. A dark light, an inverse of light, resonates from the characters, a lingering remnant of the magic that sent its travelers all the way up to the city of heaven. And speaking of those travelers, you see them now. Three gods. No, demons, loitering beneath a peach tree that's swollen with pink petals, surrounding a very nervous and very flustered Quin Xiaocheng. The first demon is the biggest. His frame is so mighty that it reminds all of you, just for an instance, of a woman ablaze in the wild sea. 
Their skin is a rich emerald green that contrasts with their crimson robes and a huge, heavy necklace of bone-white skulls on a string. His eyes are black, pure black with blood red irises. Long, thick black hair sweeps from their head to their waist with careless abandon, lined with streaks of sand-colored gold. They sport a thick black beard with the same kinds of streaks, and they wield a massive, thick-shafted monk's spade. It is a polearm with a flat spade-like blade on one end and a smaller crescent-shaped blade on the other. And he's currently balancing it across his shoulders like a golfer would with his club, standing in a casual but menacing pose. The second demon is a lith, quick person with short, dirty red hair combed out of their face and light brown skin. Their yellow-green eyes have slitted pupils and are sharp, curious, flitting constantly from object to object in this courtyard, not entirely attentive to the bullying conversation at hand. Instead of robes, they wear shanku, a flowing, wide sleeve shirt tucked into a pair of trousers, and they move with a sort of grace and precision, and their ears are tapering and mobile, constantly moving and turning to take in as much stimulus as possible. And as far as your party can tell, they're unarmed, though they do have nine long fox-like tails that sprout from their spine, fanning and waving in various directions. The third demon appears to be their leader, and for good reason. She is a feminine and vicious-looking woman with pale skin the color of bone. Her long black hair is parted in elegant bangs around her face, and she wears a set of pure white robes, the same pellucid color of her skin. A translucent shawl wraps around Tada elbows and waist, glimmering like the first snowfall of winter. Ta holds a Tuan Shan, a round black silk fan with a long wooden handle. And on either side of the fan, you see an intricately embroidered pure white skull. In the face of these three demons, Xiao Cheng has their back pressed against the trunk of a peach tree and is waving their hands in a rather defensive and appeasing manner. Ah, uh, friends from the underworld, I'm not sure where this so-called river gourd you're looking for might be, but might I suggest you return to the underworld while I personally search the city on your behalf so you don't have to waste your time up here? The massive demon leans in, his thick beard bristling as he speaks. Oh yeah? Well... I think the gourd we're looking for is on your waist. Oh, oh that this old thing? And Xiao Chung quickly and protectively puts their hands over the gourd, strapped to their robe, and pivots their hips to hide it. Oh, this this is this is a wine gourd from the Western Wind God. I I borrowed it from their private stores, you know. The lith quick demon leans in, <laughs> sniffing the air around the covered gourd. I don't smell wine. Tang Tang smells magic. That's the river gourd, isn't it? No, no, stop sniffing. It's a wine gourd. It doesn't smell like wine because I, I drank it all. The beautiful demon raises a hand and her compatriots lean back. She steps forward and Xiao Cheng shrinks under Ta the shadow. Oh, don't be scared. Scared, little courtier. We're just here for the gourd. Nothing more, nothing less. This doesn't have to be painful. Just hand it over and maybe we'll let you go with your skin still attached to your flesh. Eep! Uh, <clears throat> I mean, eep. I, I can't. And I won't. This gourd is mine, and you can't have it. The massive demon bursts out laughing like rumbling thunder, and this lith demon kind of snorts in a quick fox-like way. And the beautiful but vicious-looking demon smiles in a way that doesn't quite reach Tada's eyes. You hear that? 
，沙朗，糖糖。Oh yeah, I sure do. <laughs> Loud and clear, Bai Guqing. It looks like our little friend from the city of heaven is asking us very kindly to please, oh please, separate their bones from their little body. So let's give them an underworld welcome, shall we? <clears throat> and Shalong, the massive demon, starts. To step forward, but that's when the three of you arrive, and you hear all of this. You see all of this. You witness all of this. So Nova, how do you fuck up the demon's day? Back off! And Sayer will throw his crescent blades to chink at the uh, like monk staff、uh, with the with the curved shovel and a crescent blade at the end of it.、Like、I love that. Could you use a different verb? <laughs>、uh. <laughs> Just as a retake for the podcast. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. I think it's hilarious. Uh. uh Sayer arrives. Does not bother to ask any questions, and he looks up at the largest demon that's ahead of him. And he raises his crescent blades and says, "Back off!" And will、uh, toss the crescent blade like a discus, aiming for the staff that the larger one is、uh, wielding. Excellent! It flings forward. You're aiming it at the staff. Are you trying to knock it out of Shalong's arms, or just kind of get his attention so he'll turn to you?、Uh, I I want for、uh, Kenolo Sos. I kind of want to knock it in such way that it knocks him off balance a little bit because that's a heavy weapon. Okay, so that's gonna be a move. I think. I think yes, this is to channel your、so. power because you're not、Ooh. trying to like hurt him necessarily in this moment, right? You're not trying to like for now unleash violence. <laughs> yeah, this is more like a warning shot. Okay, so when、mm-hmm. you channel your mythos or logos to overcome an obstacle, reshape the environment, or extend your senses, describe how your power flares and roll two d six plus tags. I think you already described it, so just make that roll, baby. <laughs> yes, I will make、hey, that roll. I have a question to ask. Just, just, just. Yeah, go ahead, Lumira. Oh, 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 I know where this is going. I know where this is going. You and me, Sam. What? I'm, I'm sitting over here, like, so my boy. Dice luck, knock some wood for myself. Calling this out, <laughs> don't be too hot and spicy. So like, what if what if I added like some seasoning on top of that? Like, You'd like to if, help. You'd like to help Sayer throw this like a discus. Yeah. Okay. But like, do I? But my real question was: Is do I have to call that before we find out what he rolled or after? You know what? No, no. But I will be kind and say you don't have to, so、Thanks. we can see、I'm、what what the role is、yep. like.、Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> Go for it. Okay. Nice, Connie. Because、right. he could、um, surprise us, which is why I was like, you know, Val surprise I- us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> listen, it would、We're、be a nice change of pace.、Cars. Val's like, dice. I think that's not an abject failure. All right, okay, Val. Okay, okay. I need you to make a point for me. All right, like we need to salvage some things over here. All right, die. We all right, can't. Right, will... We can't grade on a curve. We can't do it on a curve here, Val. <laughs> All right, Val. What power tags are、uh, you invoking? I am using how to hunt. I am using、okay. uh, crescent blades,、Excellent. and that's about it. Because I don't have powerful against demons, so、uh, plus two. Well, you know, demons would count as gods. Aha!、Yes, powerful、I'm、against gods, baby. Okay,、Let's、then、go. I'm going to invoke weak to gods and just、yeah. a weapon. Yep, that's fine. So weak to gods in terms you- of it's. The same kind of trade-off that you had against Twinzing's Azir Serpent form.、Mm. Just a weapon means if this goes south, your I think innate viciousness might flare and make this do more damage than you're trying to do in this moment. Okay. Yep. Sure. Please die. Please. Just a plus one. Okay. Who? <laughs> yes. 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 That's an eleven on the die plus one for a twelve. Go team! Okay, yeah. 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 Why are we all the best? Thank you, guys. Okay, on a ten plus, the effect is exactly as intended. So you're trying to knock the pole out of this huge demon's arms and get his attention. It works. 
the Silver Crescent flings forward, hits the pole right where it's weak, and knocks it out of Shalong's arms. His arms go kind of uh, akimbo to the side, and there's a massive thump, like a huge elephant's uh, foot stomping onto the ground as the monk blade hits hits the pollen-covered floor and rolls a few feet away. Huh. Hey, what the hell? Not cool. You heard me. Back off. I'm not gonna back. <laughs> oh, look. Three new little ants here to play ball. Well, you can have your fun with this one after we're done taking the gourd. And Shalong kind of starts to stomp over to where the monk spade had fallen out of their shoulders and bends down with not too much finesse. You get the sense that he's really big and strong, but physically perhaps doesn't move too quickly. Lumira feeling a bit too much in her bag, backed up by both Zainan and Seir, will just chuckle to herself. <laughs> so here's a difference between me and my friend here. My friend asked. I'm not asking. The other two demons don't completely turn away from, from Xiao Sheng. They're still keeping an eye on them so they don't run away. But they do cheat out to face your approaching party. And the vulpine one with nine different fox-like tails like moves forward and starts sniffing kind of at the three of you, but without bridging the gap yet. Hey, hey, my good thing. They're not gods, not demons neither. They're cultivators. <laughs> Can we, can we, you know, can we maybe just focus, Tong Tong? Well, 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 what do we have here? Three would-be do-gooders. Like my compatriot Shalong said earlier, you are more than welcome to come have a little soiree with the courtier here. We just want the gourd, then we'll be on our way. Really, we the only the person- We want the courtier and the gourd. Oh, Both of them. I'm afraid that's not gonna happen. I'm afraid I didn't ask. And Lumira will f flourish her hands in front of her and cast whoever this is in a liminal. Okay, sounds Absolutely like you guys are starting not. a fight. <laughs> so that one, okay, that that action would constitute starting a fight, a combat, I think. Uh, so I'm going to need you all first. so hard. Yeah, I don't think so. I think y'all are fighting. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Actually, no, I'm not sorry. I'm not we're sorry not really. Who the fuck did you think you were trying. talking to? Okay. <laughs> I think instead of diving into action, since Lumira's acting first, that's your first action of this combat, of this fight. So that's going to be to channel your power. Cool. All right, let's do this. Um, I'm going to... Just roll 2d6 plus tags, because you've already described how you're yeah. flaring your fingers I'm out. To, that's what I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to figure yeah, out trying to which trap tag her. I'm going to okay. use. Like, I'm freeze, acting freeze first, so I don't mm -hmm. get a chance to use anything in relation to diagnoses or first aid. So what I will use is love is power as well as forbidden knowledge. I want to use control of time as well as creating liminals and shielded by time, too. But okay, I that's a will plus five, also right? inflict doesn't understand this power. Okay, that's a on minus myself. one. I'm also gonna <clears throat> that makes sense because you have no idea what you're doing and it could go completely awry. I'm also going to invoke disrupts the journey as okay. another minus one and fatigued. Okay. So plus this has two. been a lot and y'all have not had a chance. Yep. So that right. is a plus two. Cool, cool, cool. That's uh, a good hot seven. Okay, so on a seven to nine, choose one. The effect is limited or the effect is volatile? What's it gonna be? <laughs> what if the effect was volatile, Connie? Please, I love that. That's always, <laughs> I think that's such a sexy option. I'm so into it. Yes. So what does it look like as for a second, everything seems to be under control and a bubble filled with translucent clock ears flickers into existence around Bai Guzing. 
I think Lumira was feeling a bit too much in her bag and she's got so much on her plate right now while she's dealing with the information that she has. And what happens is much like, much like in the gardens in the wild sea, we see this bubble, but time around it rapidly speeds up. Mm. Mm. So, yeah. So it <laughs> seems like kind of the optical illusion is that for, for her, everything around her is super fast, but she, to the outside, looks like she's just in dense slow-mo. Lovely. Super into this. So here's where the volatility comes in. The liminal spheres itself into existence, and for half a second, it's in control of you, and then you feel a red hot, sharp spike of soul-chilling pain rock upward from your gold-tipped left fingers. And then a liminal flickers around Sayer and then disbands, and then flickers around the cherry, uh, the peach tree, and we see peaches suddenly ripen even more, and a bunch of them start falling to the ground, and then it discorporates, and then so for this entire combat, liminals are gonna randomly flicker into and out of existence all over this courtyard. Lumira! <laughs> okay, so who is the next person who's gonna act? I'm gonna let the boys decide between the two of you. I think Zynan was about to say something. So I think Zynan was like, literally he had like put his thumbs in his belt and was sidling up to this extremely hot demon. And then suddenly she's encased in a liminal and he's just like, the fuck is this? Uh, and so he turns to, I think it's Tong Tong. Yes. <laughs> uh, and seeing that Nova is going to Nova this situation, um, he just leans over and says, boo. And as he does, he fully embraces the ghost form. Oh my god, y'all are just using your forbidden magics here, okay? <laughs> he doesn't really understand that it's super forbidden. He's Did just not. new to this. <laughs> I just threw my sword. Forbidden. <laughs> Love it. Forbidden. What um, are you trying to do? Are you trying to scare them? He wants to uh, scare this poor demon. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, before you do anything, I need you to roll a d4. Okay, I'm now scared. For the liminal. I'm so, I oh. knew it, I knew it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you got a three? Okay, yes. you are not affected by a liminal in this action. <laughs> All right, so you can do your move as normal, but you do see liminals pulsing into existence erratically all around you as you lean in. I think this is going to be a... I, I think I channel your power as well. You're trying to use this ghostly uh, connection to scare Tong Tong. So roll 2d6 yes. plus tags. All right. I'm sorry. I'm we're gonna so do. Learning. We're gonna do untethered existence. Okay. Um, messages from beyond. Okay, that makes sense. And resourceful criminal. <laughs> okay, I'm going to invoke a thin mask. Yep. Uh, because who knows if you're able to keep up this intimidation or if something less secure filters through in this attempt to strike fear. And I'm also yeah. going to invoke haunted by dusty memories as you step back yeah. into the ghost realm and you feel a familiar thing, a swell of grief, a swell of tragedy behind a closed door that you're not looking at. So roll 2d6 plus one. And he feels like he's standing in a memory as he's here as well. Mm. Oh, that's really bad. Cool. This is going to go great, y'all. Um, yes! So that's a five total. <laughs> On a six minus, the GM will describe how your Mythos or Logos spirals out of your control. Mark one fade or crack on a theme of your choice. I think it makes, I, it's, I think yeah. you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes sense which uh, theme is being faded or cracked here. I think what this means is as you lean forward into the ghost realm and say, boo. Tang Tang turns to look at you and their entire body shapeshifts, right? It, 
they change. The nine tails wrap around their form, and when they come back down, the tails are gone, and so is this vulpine-like face. In its stead, you see Azalise. But it's not Azalise's eyes exactly, they're slitted and they look fox-like, but everything else about Azalise is exactly as you remember. What do they look like, Zynan? Their skin is so close that he can almost touch it like stars, like night sky. Their dark hair with the braids move with this unnatural movement that doesn't belong to them at all and the scarf that they wear isn't right the pattern isn't one from Kiseki it's different and he doesn't recognize it but it's the right scarf it's just completely wrong and Mm. he's so shocked by this that he looks down and he is also not in his clothes from the city of heaven, he's suddenly wrapped in the clothes from Kaseki, farm boy. He doesn't mm-hmm. go here. And the voice that comes out of Azalise's mouth is not theirs. It's still this fox spirits and tongue tongue laughs and moves Azalise's face in a way you've never seen Azalise's face move. It contorts with a kind of cheerful, a prickish attitude, and they say. <laughs> Well, it appears that you're new to the ghost realm, but I'm not. You dabble with what's in the past too much, you might end up getting your heart hurt, little ghost boy. And Tong Tong darts forward and brushes the side of your cheek with a sharp, clawed nail that does not belong on Azalisa's hand. I need you to increase haunted by one, or take haunted one if you don't have that already. Yeah, no, we're increasing haunted, you're right. Excellent. We pan across the battlefield to find Sayer. Roll me a d4. Okay. Two. You are affected by a liminal, so. Thank you. I wanted that. So- yes. Roll, roll me a second d4. That's another two again. Okay. So you are going to be stuck in a similar liminal as to... You can still do something, but you are, you kind of, as you start to move, you enter a space and then everything around you seems to move extremely quickly. You can still pass through the space as part of your movement for your turn, uh, but that's going to affect your actions and the consequences thereof. What would you like to do? I think in this moment, there is uh, the velvet on Sayer's antlers begins to chip away as time Mm. goes on and peels off and there's like specks of red blood that begin to like flare up within the liminal like little globules that oscillate all around him uh oh i'm so mad but i'm also in a liminal and i've never been in one so i think sayer doesn't know if his blades will reach so he will instead focus on trying to break out of the liminal in the most crude like physical like he's reaching his hands through the little invisible sphere where the where the mm-hmm. line meets and is trying to tear himself out okay question for you i realized i had to ask this probably earlier when he threw the blade and like a, were you expecting it to come back like a boomerang yes Yes. Okay. Okay. Because you were so successful, I think it did. So you have both of your blades. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to establish that. You enter the liminal, and I think you're going to have to unleash violence against the liminal. The liminal. With your crescent yeah. plates. Yes. So roll two d six plus tags. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Two d six plus tags. So I will invoke um, my crescent blades because I got them. Uh, Excellent. How how to hunt? Uh, I will actually pick a uh, hungry form. I am so focused right now in my hunger that I am breaking through it violently like an animal, like a caged animal trying Mm. to bite through their enclosure. Are you using your blades or are they sheathed and you're using your hands? (laughs) Uh, I think he's using his blades. Not that I have two. Okay, makes sense. I'll use them both. Excellent. That's a plus two, yes? Mm -hmm. I'm going to invoke scares people as you're letting this like innate kind of destructive power uh flow through you so go for it 
Oh, I need to be less happy about when you invoke my weaknesses. Okay. Plus one. That yeah. uh, that is a nine total. Not terrible. Okay. On a seven to nine, you exchange blows with the liminal. So you <laughs> technically you get to inflict the status with tier equals tags. I'm gonna rule as you're able to break out by the end of your turn. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're also going to take uh, or worsen a status of my choice. I'm going to have it be. This is fun. Cursed. You're gonna worsen your cursed status by one. And what this right. means is, as your claws from the crescent blades dig in and you rip it, you wrench it apart, the liminal shatters around you. And Lumira, as that liminal does shatter, you feel another searing jolt of pain ricochet up the gilded part of your arm. And you know no! it's from Seir. <laughs> and Seir, you have been cursed by the eye of time, as you are identified as a threat. I think the gold for a minute, Lumira, seems to take on a will of its own. It constricts around your hand, and you see your hand twisting away from your body like it wants to go towards Seir and trap him again, prevent him from hurting you. Do you fight this? Absolutely, I'm gonna fight this. Are you kidding me? Okay, you're able to wrestle control over your hand very easily. What does it look like? I think, I think Lumira looks at Sayer and just briefly for a second, she sees him and Sing, but like oh. 12, like they're not when she first got there, but just when they really started getting into shit at trans together, the the four of them. Or the, it, it, she sees that for a second, and I think you actively see her like wrestle her left hand back into her and stuffing it into her cloak pocket, mm. like kind of like using her cloak to wrap it up and hold it tight against her to stop it. I love that. Yeah, you immediately just stuff your hand back towards your chest and you hold it right into your cloak pocket. Like, no, you can't, that's your friend. What, for a moment, it feels almost like your your, your arm, no, the gilded thing on your arm, this connection with Kronergy wanted you to do something and then it kind of slackens. And you got the sense that it wasn't just to hurt Seir, it was specifically to protect you. And Seir, I'd like to do a soft retcon. Instead of Cursed 2, I'd like you to take watched by time too. So as you break out of this liminal, you get the distinct feeling that you are being seen, observed, but you don't see eyes anywhere. It's not the demons, it's not your strike team, it's not Xiao Chung, it's not anything that's here. It's something beyond this place, maybe even within the journey that suffuses all of the sister realms, but then you've tumbled out of the liminal and you're back into the middle of the fray and you are standing directly in front of Sunlong. By now, he has finally picked up his weapon. <laughs> uh, this entire time, this huge demon was just bending over to pick up the monk spade, and now it whoosh, finally goes over his shoulder again. But it's not his turn quite yet, because now that all of you have gone, it's time for your allies to do something. Um, Xiao Cheng, Xiao Cheng, please, <laughs> sees Everything that's happening. Bai Gu Jing stuck in the liminal. Sun Lung having, f with his back turned to them, picking up this monk spade. And Tang Tang menacing Zainan. They, their eyes are wide, orange, darting. They turn and they begin to flee. They start to run out of the battlefield toward one of the buildings surrounding the courtyard. <laughs> and they're booking it. Uh, and they're, they vanish behind a set of fruit trees in a whisk of uh, deep green robes. And now it's time for the demons to do demon shit. Shalong <sighs> finally hoists the monk spade uh, up over his shoulder. You see him kind of, actually, I'm gonna soft recon. I don't wanna, I wanna do Shalong last. Uh, Bai Guzing. 
Bai Gu Jing. Let's out a deep intake of breath. And on the exhale, instead of breaking out of the liminal with force like Sayer had, you see her very slowly start to turn within it, uh, reaching for the beautiful sash that's kind of draped around her robes. And in very slow bullet time, you see as she takes the sash, it starts to transform in her grasp. It turns from a translucent sash to a long, sharp, jagged sword made of reticulated bone. And this entire time she's moving in slow motion, this is happening while all of you were acting. She cocks her head, uh, her arm back and throws this sharp jagged th sword forward. And as soon as the tip of this lash exits the liminal, it moves uh, in, in regular speed. And it all the way toward Lumira. Sam is taking a bio brick, so actually it's not gonna go toward Lumira. <laughs> Let me retcon. It goes all the way forward toward Zainan while you're being menaced and distracted by Tong Tong. So this uh, reticulated sword is going to wrap around your left wrist and these sharp bone spurs dig into your arm, dig into your body, and you begin to feel your vitality being drained from your person and siphoned into this demon. But <laughs> in a strange twist of fate and an irony, the pain grounds you to reality, grounds you to what's happening here, starts to pull you out of the ghost realm. Would you like to accept taking drained three and also be anchored back into reality or resist this? Uh, I would like to resist this, please and thank you. Sounds good. I have, after some revision for playtesting, changed the resist a status move to make it flow more easily. So when you resist taking a negative status, burn a tag for every tier you reduce. So this is drained three. You would have to burn three tags to reduce all of it. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, I think I'm going to... Oh. I think I'm gonna burn at least one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna say um, unspoken eulogies. Okay. Because uh, all of these people remind him of some people he used to know and he can't stop <gasps> thinking about it. <laughs> yep. And the one that didn't now does. <laughs> you don't have to roll anything I, for it. You just burn oh, it one for great. one. Great. One, one to one. Perfect. Okay, so you would just take drained two if you're only burning one tag. Okay, I just need to take less statuses. I'm so scared. <laughs> okay, it's all good. Cool. So you still feel some of your vitality being drained, but you resist it, right, by kind of anchoring yourself to that theme of yours. Uh, and now we pan across the battlefield to find Tong Tong. Sam is still gone, so uh, I am going to have... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have Tong Tong... <laughs> uh, as soon as you are kind of pulled a little bit out of the ghost realm, those tails swirl out of nowhere again. Nine of them, a uh, vulpine and orange with those bright alabaster tips <laughs> swirl around this knot, Azalise, this falsehood of Azalise, this illusion of Azalise. And Zainan, roll me a d10. One for each tail, plus a secret, uh, secret surprise. Okay. Nine. <laughs> okay, that's one of my favorite ones. So as soon as the tails come down, you see that Tang Tang has gotten a lot bigger. This shape changer has ballooned to twice their height as they take on the form of a giant panda. Uh, with a huge lumbering ursine body, black limbs, and a face that kind of looks like a bandit's face with its uh, uh, black circles around the eyes. And uh, they just go, and they fall forward onto you with the intention of entrapping you underneath their massive body. This would be a pinned five, which means you can't take any actions related to maneuvering your body as long as you're trapped underneath this panda, which you like to resist. I don't have any more tags that I think I should burn right now, so no. <laughs> so what does it look like as you get, bam, pinned underneath this huge bear? Uh, I think first he was looking at this blade wrapped around his wrist, 
and he was making a plan to escape from that, and just as Tan Hung just grows in front of him, he's looking, looking, and then suddenly the sun vanishes behind the giant panda bear, and I think, Sarah, you just see just, like, a panicked look before he is completely crushed by this giant bear, just like, ah, but only in his eyes. <laughs> and then bam the shadow goes over you and Zion and Ash vanishes underneath the massive mass of this panda bear and now we sweep across the battlefield to Shalong. Shalong has straightened with this monk spade uh, across his shoulders but in one hand he turns to you Seir and he kind of shakes his head side to side like a wolf ready to charge and you see the golden threads going through their black hair going through his black beard lift off of his hair and transform into sand and the sand starts to cover the battlefield between the two of you obscuring his uh, positioning from your eyes. You don't know where he's going to strike. It's not just the visuals. It's like tiny million little needles digging into your skin, digging into your eyes. And there's also the roar of a sandstorm confusing your senses. You can't tell where he's going to strike. And then you see it. Your shadow. Your shadow in the middle of this sandstorm, it twists elongates, becomes denser, and then surging out of your shade, a hand outstretched to intercept the spade end coming out from your blind spot. Yikhe. <gasps> Protector of Zhao Yao, the chosen of Yin An. They completely surface out of your shadow and grab onto the blade with their back pressed against yours with their naked hand and yet it doesn't bleed. And with a strength that does not befit their lithe, insecure form, Yin He shoves Shalong away and off of you and they step out of your shadow. They turn to face you as you're covered by the swirling sand. Seer, hi, are you okay? Yin He, what are you? Why are is they here? here? Actually, Sears. Mira and Zion, and neither of you can see this for now. They're blanketed in swirling sand. I can't see anything. I'm under a panda. Yeah, I... you're under a panda. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm watching <laughs> Zion under a panda, so. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sayer, like, holds onto the forearms of Yinka's. What are you? What are you doing here? Uh, Artemis. What? I, How I, I, are they know, injured? I know. I. Sorry, could you repeat that? Are they injured? No, no, they look perfectly whole, perfectly intact. Their eyes are wide, blinking, looking at you. A kind of flustered expression settles over them. Artemis, right, the person who cast me back to Chao Yao. I, I, I've been keeping an eye on you. I wanted to keep you safe. I didn't know. There's so much I wanted to say, but I wasn't sure. And, and, and interrupting this conversation is the polearm. It once again, it swoops out of nowhere in the middle of the sand, in the middle of this demon's home, this, 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 this territory he knows how to traverse so well, and it smacks Ying He across the ribs with a sickening crunch. They let on a, uh, and they're flung into the wall of sand, whisked away by this demon, and the sand dies down. It swirls back into Shalong's beard and Shalong's hair, and you see them, uh, having flung Ying He across the battlefield, they've slammed into the trunk of a cherry tree with pink cherry blossoms fluttering all over them like a pink snowfall, and they slump against the roots and they kind of go limp for a second. Ying He! And say something snaps in Sayer as he watches the cherry blossoms flutter around Ying He's stock still limp body for a moment. And he turns over to Shaolang. So you want to die then? But <gasps> let me grant you your wish and I will unleash violence. Excellent. I mean, we're going right back to the top of the order with, for PCs. Mm -hmm. I think you're gonna act first. So unleash violence. What, how are you trying to unleash violence upon Shaolang and what power tags do you invoke? <laughs> Sayer digs deep down into that monstrosity he knows there's something has snapped within him all <laughs> all bets are off 
everything that he's tried to suppress is gone now. Ying He protected him. It's not supposed to work that way. He is supposed to protect Ying He. He was supposed to protect Sing. He's supposed to protect Nova. And he will not fail again. And I will use my uh, monstrous countenance, powerful okay. against gods, hungry okay. form, <laughs> how to hunt. Okay. okay. And Ying He, because oh. Ying He just got hurt for me. That's true. The only other tag I'm going to invoke is weak to gods, uh, but that's still a plus mm -hmm. four. Mm hmm. Let's see how this goes. Let's go, baby. All right. Let's go. Let's go. So that's a. How much again? Plus two? Plus four. Plus four. Plus four. Perfect. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That's an eleven total. <gasps> On a. Okay. Just tell me. Tell me what you do. On an eleven. Eleven. Uh, Sayer makes that promise known to Shaolong, and the shrine dog fangs grow out of his <gasps> face. The tusks, uh, pull forward from the jaw and his arm turns into almost like a lion-like bear paw as it uh, kind of like oscillating around his arm a thick band of, of like stony fur and his large claws grow out of his hand and he just smacks Shaolong across the face and, he, oh. and he'll start pouncing on him and as soon as he gets a grip onto Shaolong I want to bite into Shaolong. Oh, what the fuck? Where are you biting this man? Bite him on a, on a, on a sexy shoulder. How's that sound? Oh, yeah. You, you pound him onto the ground. He's bigger than you. You're massive and strong, but this guy is like igni size. But you take him to the ground. And just like the way that you disarmed him, it's like an elephant's foot stomping onto the floor. Doof! The floor vibrates as both of you go sprawling across pollen and rotten fruit, and you're biting into him. You're biting into his shoulder. You're tearing. You're ripping. You're letting this, <laughs> this anger, this destruction, this disaster course through you, feed you this bloodlust. So, would you like to not suffer or worsen a status in return, glean a weakness, flaw, or hidden desire, or seize an advantage? <laughs> Ooh, delicious. Uh, I get to choose one. Uh, I would like to glean a weakness, flaw, or hidden desire. This demon, as you're biting into him, is letting out a- ah, Get off me! Get off me! What the fuck?! Ah, get off me! He's terrified. Whatever is driving you has struck fear, genuine fear, into Shaolong's heart. And there's a pause as the other demons stop. Fighting, they turn. You see, Bai Guizing finally steps out of the liminal, or rather, the liminal vanishes because it's so volatile around her. She falls uh, gracefully onto her feet, but turns her head, that long black hair swirling in the wind. And the massive panda also lets out, uh, kind of looks up in Shalong's direction. And here, you sense that these other two demons are fearful of you, too. A cultivator, a person, a divinely touched monk. Eating? Attacking? Biting? A demon? This is not the way. This is wrong. This is terrifying. And in that moment, you understand even demons are scared of the devouring. And Seiya removes his jaw from the shoulder of Shaolong. What color is Shaolong's blood? His skin is dark emerald green. So I think it's a bright azure blue. Blue blood pulls across Sayer's jaw and drips down onto his chest and the hem of his sash. And he looks over towards the other two frightened demons. And he just looks them directly in the eye, presses down onto the wound that he has just made in Shalong. Bai oh. please, this guy is out of his mind! Enough! Tong Tong, back. And Zion, you finally feel a massive weight lift off of your chest as this panda becomes smaller, 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 and lifts up in a swirl of tails, becomes this vulpine demon again. <sighs> you know what? We're not getting paid enough for this, so... And Bai Guzing lifts up her hands, the reticulated sword, 
turns back into just the translucent shawl that drip, drapes across her elbows again, and she's starting to back away toward the ascension gate. Do Zynan you let her go? Up. Go ahead. And uh, from underneath the panda, he'd managed to fish his hand down into his belt further, and he's just holding his dagger, that hooked dagger, because in him, something very old has been awoken. Mm. That need to survive, that calling. And he steps forward. He doesn't even look at Seer. He doesn't see the blood. He doesn't look at Lumira holding her arm close. He steps forward and looks these demons in their eyes. You better run now before we change our minds. <laughs> Tang Tang, get Shala. And Tang Tang lets out a, yes, ma'am. And the tails swirl, and when they come back down, they turn into a massive dire wolf, uh, big enough to get underneath the fallen Shalong, kind of huff it, uh, huff him onto their back. They limp toward the ascension gate, and as all three demons back away onto the raised stone dais, Bai Gu Jing says, as the runes begin to glow with that void light once more, <laughs> oh, we were just kidding around, you know, just a couple of demons, a trail of demons having fun, get gone. The three of you have going on, you need to get that checked out. I as soon as Tung Tung- you listen to my partner. <laughs> as soon as, you, as Tung Tung approaches to get Sha Long and like by Gu Jing is trying to coax away from this, Sayer Eyes brimming with bloodlust, looks over the tongue tongue and just goes, <sighs> just to uh, a kind of wolfish whine of terror flinches away from you and limps onto the dais. Hmm. Well, I would say it was nice to meet you, but. <sighs> And a pillar of black light shoots up from the ascension gate, and as soon as it's down, they're gone. And a sense of tension dissipates for a half second across this courtyard, but it is soon interrupted. You barely get a second to catch your breath. You barely get a heartbeat to look at each other and, and, and discuss what just occurred when all of you hear a flapping noise uh, and a and Goose comes out, yes, comes waddling insistently, honking very loudly, flapping his wings loudly and aggressively approaching the battlefield, running toward the dais. Uh, and as the light dies down, Goose like hops onto the dais and looks around, honk, 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 peck, 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 like they're pecking the place where uh, the it? demons used to be. Honk, honk, and they're desperately flapping their wings and they like kind of waddle back down and half glide, half run back to you, Zainan. Honk, honk, honk. Xiao Chong is safe, I think. Honk, Xiao Chong! Honk, honk, honk. Oh, it's not that. Hello. And Xiao Chong steps out from behind a tree, the same tree that Ying He is slumped at. And Ying He is in the middle of kind of rubbing their head and starting to get up. Uh, Xiao Chong looks down and tentatively reaches a hand forward and helps this demigod up to their feet. Hello there. Hi. Um. I think we have a lot to discuss. And as this dust clears, we see the figures that remain in Plum Leaf Courtyard. We see Ying He shifting from foot to foot, awkwardly refusing eye contact with each of you. We see Goose ruffling his feathers, looking in the direction of the vanished demons with despair and distraught and disappointment. And finally, Xiao Cheng. We see slowly straightening to their full height, twisting their hips so that river gourd is in full view, but their arms are wrapped protectively around it, around all of the gods trapped within. And that's where we're going to end the session. Uh, so thank you all so much for tuning in to this special Arc 2 episode. I've been your game master and creative producer, Connie Chong. Find me across the internet at Bye Connie Chong. That's B-Y-C-O-N-N-I-E-C-H-A-N-G. I'm going to pass things over to Val. Uh, okay, okay, I guess I'll say things. Hi, everyone. 
I am Valiant, let me bite a demon Dorian. I use he and his pronouns. You can find me all around the internet at Valiant Dorian or at Otsu Spirit Bear. Please enjoy that lovely treasure I just set you on. And tonight I have the distinct pleasure of playing your local devourer, Sayir, who uses he, they pronouns. And I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Pop Up. Sorry, Pop Up! Hi everyone, I'm Kai, I use he, they, and she pronouns. Uh, and tonight I had the pleasure of being a man crushed by a bear. Zidane's preferred way to go, uh, Mr. Oh Zanin Esh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm going to pass it off to our liminal creator of the hour. Hey, y'all. Um, this is me, Sam Star, playing Lumira. Did I expect that to happen? No. Do I really care because my team is still here in the aftermath of it? Seemingly ineffective? Absolutely. Hi. Um, yeah, you can find me all across the internet at Lust for Life X, L U S T T F O R L I F E E X. Uh, I played Lumira, our favorite bad bitch. What's going on, boss? Take us home. It's a me, the boss. Uh, so much happened that episode. I had prepped for combat, I had also prepped for diplomacy. <laughs> so. Interesting that we immediately went to throw hands. I love it. I um, decided was gonna try. <laughs> I did not mean to immediately get active. Like Lumira was, I don't know, something triggered stand on business. Sometimes the story <laughs> just compels you to do what you gotta do. Uh, so we will yeah. be back next week. That's going to be March, can I do edition? March 16th, 8 p.m. US Eastern time uh, for the continuation of this and the week after that. It's Erika Ishii time! Uh, so excited for that! Again, I wonder which NPC they're going to portray. Woo! Uh, so excited for that. Uh, love you all so much. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you are on Twitch, stick around for the raid. Uh, no doubt we are going to be raiding someone really awesome. So use the raid message in chat. Tell them about the everything that happened this episode, as always. I'm so sweaty. Uh, we love you all so much. Join the Discord server if you'd like to talk to our community of fans who are, get traumatized by us willingly every week. Uh, and support us on Patreon if you can throw at least just even $3 a month at us. That helps us so, so, so immensely. That's the cost of like a coffee every month and it helps us so much and you get access to a lot of cool stuff. So patreon.com slash transplanerrpg. That's the best way to support us. We love you all so much. See you next week. And then in two weeks for Erika Ishii. Bijou, bijou.